Okay, why don't we get started? Um, welcome everybody to what has become an annual event, our fall seminar. We've really been having it for at least 20 years. So I think that's a pretty good record. Um, I think we're, we're really dedicated to trying to give you good information, uh, no sales pitches at all, and um, you know how people talk about fake facts these days, fake news. Uh, we pretty much are really against fake news, fake information. We just want to give you the, the real thing. So that's why we have these seminars, and so we welcome you. Uh, my name is Richard Land. I'm a member of a law firm that goes by the name of Chipman Mizuko Land in Pinerola, but we shorten that to make life easier uh, for you to Chipman Mizuko. We have eight attorneys, uh, four paralegals, uh, and other staff. You put us together as about 15 people devoted to the practice of law. And I'd like to take a moment, because there's, there's more of us here than just me, I'd like to take a moment to ask our, our, our folks who are here to stand up, please. Um, there's Tim Herring, uh, litigation. There's Liz Hardery, she's in the Trusted States Department, brand new, uh, uh, out of law school, just passed the bar. Casey Olden, Casey is uh, working in the business law area, and litigation area, and we have my fellow presenter, Allison Marcusio, who's a member, and I'll tell you more about her when she's about to speak. Well, we've got some staff people here too, and I'll just take the opportunity to say, thank you very much for coming. Um, so, I have four, four basic practice areas. I just want to cover those quickly before we move on. Our basic practice areas are the trust and estates area, that's estate planning, estate settlement, estate, uh, trust administration. That's where Allison and I, and also Liz, uh, three of us devoted to that practice area. That's pretty much all we do, day in and day out. But we've got business law, uh, real estate and land use, and the litigation that, that covers those practice areas. Tonight's program, obviously, is being presented to you from our Trust and Estates group. Uh, first, it's going to be me talking, well, it's the main event, really, is Allison's. Uh, she's going to be talking about the legal issues and, and other issues that come up as people age, and it looks like there's a role reversal going on. Traditionally, you know, you grow up, you take, you're being taken care of by your parents, then all of a sudden, roles are reversed, parent needs care, now child is, is a caregiver to the parent, and that's quite a change, and there are lots of legal issues to think about when during that continuum where that that slide uh, into the frailties of old age uh, is happening. So that's going to be her topic and my topic is just going to be there's a lot of change that goes along goes goes on all around us and lately I've been getting people saying I haven't I haven't changed my will in 15 years I did a will 15 years ago it's only 15 years how could I possibly need to change it now? I look at the will and everything looks fine. And my, I want to say, but you don't really understand. The will may, not, may look fine to you, but I bet anything in those 15 years, there's been so many changes that affect uh, whether that will will give you the outcome that you'd, you'd uh, want. So my job tonight is to try to identify those things that happen around you that, that, may, that should make you think a will review, a estate planning re review is necessary. Also, we have what I think is, when you get right down to it, I personally think this is the niftiest thing I've ever done, which is the, we have an online estate planning review. And in the package, you'll see the type of, of report that's generated by that review. I mean, what it is, you go through a series of questions. 
It's an issue identifier. It's not going to answer legal questions for you, but it's going to identify issues that may be really important for you to, to, to look at in order to achieve the goals that you want to achieve in your estate plan. This, so this is customized. I, I did a sample just the other night going through the, the question and answers pretty quickly. It's customized to, to the specific facts of your case. You really should take a look at it. When you get right down to it, if you were going to come to us for a consultation for that same type of thing, it would easily, consultation together with the preparation of the memo, cost you $600. So it's a, it's a nice little freebie you can get that can be very useful. So keep those things in mind as I'm talking. I'm gonna be going through some things pretty quickly, but you can always go back to those resources to, to get some of the answers you may be looking for. So now I'll start, sorry for that long introduction, but I, I thought it was important to point those things out to you. The question is, why should you review? And I've listed some of the reasons. There's uh, an opportunity to correct mistakes. We're all human. Uh, even lawyers make mistakes, so there may be a mistake in there. It doesn't hurt to look at it periodically just to make sure that everything's the way it should be. But, but also, our clients can make mistakes. We tell our clients uh, to, in order to make their estate plans work, we give them all sorts of information about how to do beneficiary designations for life insurance policies, how to change the ownership of their assets, uh, whether joint accounts uh, are a good thing in your case or not so good thing. And many clients don't take those instructions to heart. They sign their documents and they go off and they don't take care of that kind of business. But it's important to take care of that kind of business because your plans won't work if you ignore it. As a matter of fact, if you have that type of asset, we call them non-probate assets, you know, the life insurance with a beneficiary designation, jointly owned property with right of survivorship. Those are assets that are not controlled by your will. And of course your will is where all your important instructions are, are going to be. And so if you don't have beneficiary designations properly uh, set up, uh, if you have all your property owned jointly with right of survivorship, your will won't have any, any relevance at all. So that's, it's important to look at that kind of mistake um, it's also important to try to take into account that laws change. And just in the last bunch of years, it, it hasn't been that long, we've had law changes that relate to powers of attorney. We have law changes that relate to living wills, that's the, in healthcare instructions. We've had law changes that relate to probate court reform. There's uh, federal estate tax law changes that have happened that uh, can be very important. I'll get into that a little bit. So there's, there's lots of law changes that can have an impact on your documents. And so, uh, because these changes seem to come along in a fast and furious way, you really need to be alert. And if you're not, if you're not looking at the newspapers, you know, with the idea I'm focusing on whether this story is going to change my estate plan, you should calendar a review every three to five years at least. So there, there are changes in the law. There's changes in the circumstances in your own personal life. Um, and we'll get into that more, but I mean, just think of how much has happened in your personal life. If, if you're like my personal life, lots of stuff has changed. Um, everybody's life changes, but you, it all seems kind of normal and mundane perhaps. But these things, these, these changes, life changes can have a big impact on the goals that you want to achieve in your estate plan. And the lives of your beneficiaries, you know, especially the lives of your beneficiaries. You, you watch your kids grow up to little toddlers, and then they grow up and they have kids, and then they get into financial trouble or their marriages fall apart. These are all things that should make you think about, well, is that plan I did 10 years ago still a proper plan? And then, then you're, you have all these instructions, you set out all this, these plans in your documents, and you're, you're naming people to, take, to take, make sure that those instructions are carried out. That's your executors, your trustees, your guardians, and you might have named them a while back 
but their lives have changed. The guy you thought was a very solid citizen, you know, 10 years ago, you find out that maybe he wasn't so solid after all. He's got another family on the other end of Philadelphia. He's got, he's run into financial trouble. He's got debts. He's got addictions. He's a mess. It's time to change. It's time to consider a change. These things can happen to your, to your fiduciaries. And, and your estate plan is only as good as the people who you pick to, to carry out your instructions. So that's a very important thing to think about. And here's another thing I almost left off the list, but just before we were coming here, I mentioned to, to Allison, well, you know, another thing that changes, technology. Um, here's a, we've been introduced to a wonderful service that helps manage assets for those people who are frail um, and maybe need help with the finances. And I think Allison's going to say a few words about that. But it's called TrueLink. And it's, a, it's my own personal discovery, um, except other, millions of other people use it and knew it before I did. <laughs> but but um, technology can change the way you do things. Um, listening to a, a seminar the other day, and this particular attorney was talking about, you know, it's really not a good idea when you have caregivers coming into the house to have all your papers all over the kitchen table. Those caregivers can see everything you've got, your social security numbers, your account numbers. He said, wouldn't it be better to have that all stuff digitized in, in, in uh, electronic format and stored someplace out of the way, maybe on a disk or something? or if you trust the internet, maybe in a cloud. I know that's a problem too. But these, these um, technologies can, can help people uh, maintain better control over their information uh, just so long as you know that there's also a danger there of identity theft that goes beyond just documents on a table. So there's, there's all sorts of things to think about. Um, I've already talked uh, a good deal about non-probate assets and how they need to be coordinated with the terms of your will. And I've listed here the types of non-probate assets, the most common types, jointly owned property, in trust for accounts, uh, transfer and death accounts, life insurance, and uh, retirement plan accounts. And I'll go into some of, the, some of this in a little bit more detail. Here's an example of a very simple example. A young parent with a child, uh, not much in the way of assets, but whatever she has, she knows my child is too young to receive an inheritance of whatever that is, $350,000. My, my, my son or my daughter is only 10 years old. I can't, I can't let that happen. Even, even if he or she was 18 years old, I couldn't let that happen. That's too young. I want trust management. So she does her will to arrange for a trust um, so that the inheritance would be managed for the child. But she forgets to name her life insurance um, beneficiary. Uh, she forgets to change it to make that work. Back when she owned the life insurance, she named her child as the beneficiary. But she forgets to change it after she does her will. So what that means is there's all that life insurance proceeds which is a large part of what she's got, will go outright to the child, exactly the opposite of what she wanted, and the terms of the will just don't control the life insurance. She needed to change the life insurance beneficiary designation so that the will would control it. And typically that would mean paying the proceeds to the estate so that the will could then send it to the trust. So that, it's that type of thing that people need to, to think about when naming beneficiaries. Uh, in trust for accounts and joint accounts, sometimes people will have the goal of benefiting all the children in equal shares. But then for some reason, and it usually happens because they're getting um, not so great advice from a, a banker, they'll go to the bank and they'll say, I want to set up an account, and, but I have a problem. I'm, af I'm afraid of getting above the FDIC insurance limits, and then the bank will say, well, why don't you try an entrust for account? Because that's handled a little bit differently. And before you know it, they have an entrust for account with a beneficiary for one of the children, 
and forgetting that that's going to disrupt the whole plan. So instead of treating everybody equally, in this case, it's going to be Jim. See, Jim is going to get more. Just because of that one simple, thoughtless kind of mistake, because people don't understand that naming the beneficiaries for thing is really an estate planning decision, and it can affect how the documents will work. Another good example of beneficiary designation mistakes has to do with retirement plan accounts. Now, retirement plan accounts, if you set it up properly, you can get, at your death, your beneficiaries can get the benefit of a very long deferral. A very long deferral, 20 years, 30 years. It's based on the life expectancy of the beneficiary. If you do it wrong, it all has to be paid out in five years. So, lots of times, a retirement plan account will have the spouse as a beneficiary, but they don't even bother to do the secondary beneficiary, which means it's, there is no secondary beneficiary, which means it, it will be paid to the estate. So if I have a retirement account, my spouse is a beneficiary, but there's no secondary beneficiary, my spouse predeceases me, then what happens? The retirement account gets paid to the estate. It must come out in five years. Now that can be a really hefty income tax bill to pay in a, in a short period of time. Whereas it could be paid out over the child's life expectancy, uh, it could be 20, 30 years. Now think of the benefits of getting, getting that deferral for that long a period of time. So that can be a big mistake. It's just important to pay attention to these things and know that they have ramifications uh, maybe more than you, you might imagine. And when naming beneficiaries for retirement plan accounts, uh, and if you have young children and you're thinking about young children as a beneficiary, you might be thinking about, well, it's not a good idea to have a youngster the beneficiary of such an account. Maybe uh, it should be in a trust. Well, you have to be really careful about the way those trusts are drafted because if they're not drafted in the way suggested by the regulations, which are very complicated, vague, and uncertain, then you've got a problem. All right, I, I blasted through that pretty fast. It's all on our YouTube videos if you want to go back and, and review those. And we'll also be taking questions at the end uh, to, to try to clarify any confusion I've created. But here's another, another mistake. This mistake has to do with an inappropriate reliance on simple wills. Now, when I'm talking about a simple will, I'm talking about a will that says, I give my estate to my spouse, if my spouse doesn't survive me, to my children in equal shares. Or if I'm not married, I just give my estate to my children in equal shares. Now that, that may be fine for many people, uh, especially for a period of time, but even though it may be fine, you don't know if it's fine unless you start, unless somebody starts asking questions. Now this, this slide, the picture on this slide is Another video, um, I did a video of LegalZoom. Uh, it's a LegalZoom review uh, because I just wanted to find out you know, what's with LegalZoom. I, I, I wanted to find out is it how, how good is it, how not good is it. So I really went into it with the idea I was gonna be fair um, and even though maybe I might be biased against uh, a, a, a um, system that purports to give you exactly what you need for $400 or so. Um, I, I did make an effort to be, to be objective about it. And one of the things I found, this is, this is one of the, the pictures from the review, is there's a total lack of questioning. It's as if they don't want you to ask questions that might affect you. So, this, this guy is wondering, you know, why didn't they ask about, why didn't they even ask for my daughter's age? You know, um, why didn't they ask me about whether I was married for a second time? And why didn't they ask me whether my wife has a disability? So all these questions need to be asked because they all relate to how your documents are drafted, whether it's a will or a will substitute like a revocable trust. Uh, your beneficiaries may have special needs related to disabilities. 
there are provisions that you can put in your documents that can help that person benefit from the trust, but at the same time, not be disqualified from getting aid. You may be in a second marriage and you want to make sure that your, your spouse is provided for, but you don't want any assets diverted uh, from your children for the first marriage. We have to ask those questions. You need to be informed about provisions you can put in your documents to both benefit your spouse and lock in assets someday for the children of the first marriage. You may, your beneficiary may be on public assistance. Do you really want to give them an inheritance if it might adversely affect their public assistance? Uh, we have some options for that situation that you, you need to think about. Your know, beneficiary might have marital problems. Do you really want to give your inheritance to a child who has marital problems thinking that what they get will just be embroiled in litigation over property settlement? or beneficiary with creditor problems, same type of thinking, or a child who just can't hold on to a nickel. They've always got to spend it, and you need a trust arrangement to protect the child from himself or herself. There, so there are different ways to handle all these things, and you don't even know to think about them unless somebody's asking you the questions. And then there's happier things. Maybe your child has done very well, he's a zillionaire, and whatever you can leave to him will just be an extra headache. And he might just say, Mom and Dad, just skip by me. Make sure the, the other grandchildren, those grandchildren out there are taken care of. So we, we need to go into all these questions. And that's why a review is important, because these are things that happen over a span of a, a lifetime. And the will you did 15 years ago, uh, when somebody was asking you questions about these matters, the answers would have been totally different. And now when we ask them again, you know, there's a, a different picture and a, a different problem, a different goal, and definitely a different solution. The, another mistake, which we mentioned before, the failure to uh, think about your executors, trustees, and guardians enough. Now, this, this shot, you obviously can't read. <laughs> and I blew it up, and you obviously can't read it as well. <laughs> um, the reason I put this up there is because I talked about the online review. And this is, this is a kind of question, questioning that we get into in the online review. Um, we want you to think about, we want you to think about what traits, what attributes anybody would like to see in their executor or trustee. So we had a list and we're basically just ask you, uh, is your selection honest uh, and fair? And will, uh, will the beneficiaries perceive that selection that way? Does the beneficiary have knowledge and experience in legal tax and investment matters? Uh, is the, is the um, if I've been saying beneficiary, I meant fiduciary executor. Is the executor intelligent? Uh, will he, demand the respect of my beneficiaries. So it goes down the list, and depending on the answers to those questions, it'll show up in that memo. But the, the point is, these are questions I think you need to ask yourself about your executors and trustees and guardians, because like I said before, you could have a very fine estate plan, the documents look great, but they're only as good as the people that you're depending on to carry out those instructions. So that's another reason to, to take a look. And that's another mistake that you may have made when you made the selection, because it's such a temptation to just name, I'll, I'll name my oldest child. You know, that's, it's, a, it's such a temptation to do that, but is it, is it the right choice? Um, how will the other kids feel about it? Will it cause some dissension, some disharmony, some litigation, which is very expensive? Another thing. Um, cash needs, cash requirements. Uh, your cash requirements can change over time. A, a, partly because of tax law changes. The cash requirements today with federal exemptions that are around $5.5 million and you put husband and spouse together, it's about $11 million. 
Well, obviously, that changes the need for cash to pay federal estate taxes. So that can change. The Connecticut estate tax law has changed a number of times. It seems to be pretty stable at $2 million right now, but, but that could change. There's, there's always proposals on the table to increase it to the federal exemption, but given Connecticut's financial state, who knows how that will fly. But there's, there's debts, there's taxes, there are expenses, and when you did your, your planning you know, 10 or 15 years ago, it might be a completely different picture than it is now. Back then, what you might have had was a home and a life insurance policy, and that's it. A uh, life insurance policy would provide lots of cash to pay the bills, uh, and that's, you know, that would be the end of the, the inquiry. But over time, things change. Now you have a home, and you have a great big huge retirement plan account, like an IRA, and no life insurance at all. The one point I want to make when you're thinking about cash needs is your IRA or your retirement account is a very bad place to get cash to pay your bills because every time you take money out of that account, you're going to pay an income tax. We don't consider that a liquid asset. We want you to look for other liquid assets. So part of the inquiry is where, where are you going to get liquidity and, and um, that's part of a review. And that's one of the things people make mistakes about. I'm not going to go into business succession management, but Allison is going to go into the incapacity planning. We're all, everybody here, no matter how young you are, you're getting older. And, and as we get older, things change. They change sometimes significantly in two years. I mean, I was, I was jumping hurdles two years ago. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm obviously kidding. Uh, but things change. And um, it's kind of a slow continuum, uh, that change that occurs from being uh, perfectly capable uh, into a, a different level where you really need help. And the amount of help you need can change over time. You know, it starts with maybe not much, and then before you know it, it's a lot. I think Allison's gonna have a lot to say about that, but it's a mistake not to, not to plan for it. And it's a mistake to delay a review when you know that that's, that's really something you need to think about. Now, tax changes. I just wanted to mention, here's a, here's a table on how Federal estate taxes have changed over the years, and you can see there's a big difference in that nine-year period because we're, we're bumping into another period of extreme uncertainty when it comes to estate taxes. The, I think when people talk about repeal of estate taxes, I think there's a, a very high likelihood that that will happen. But if it happens, you've got to be watch out, watching out for what replaces it. What will replace it could, and, and the talk we hear, and it seems like the most likely thing is come close to the Canadian system, which is at death, your assets are taxed as a, a at, well, what they do is recognize a capital gain at death. And so capital gains taxes have to be paid um, shortly after you pass away. That's the Canadian system. There's a lot of talk right now that that's where we may end up. Well, if we don't have that type of tax at death, we might have another type of tax that, that's, that's similar, but it puts off the capital gains tax exposure, what is called as carryover basis. You know, right now, when you pass away, there's an adjustment to basis for computing capital gains taxes up to date of death value. That can eliminate all of, a lot of gain. It can eliminate a lot of, of estate taxes. But one change that might occur, one of the alternatives, is a thing called carryover basis, which means your beneficiaries will not just inherit your property, but also inherit your basis in the property. So later on when they sell it, there could be a large gain. So that could happen. Uh, when it comes to gift giving, there's even talk of making gifts um, a taxable event where a capital gain might be taxed. So we don't know what's going to happen. 
But it's a fair bet that if repeal does come along, it will be like the last time there was a repeal. There will be a, a phase-in period with a sunset at the end of 10 years. What that means is the repeal law would be in effect for 10 years, but at the end of the 10-year period, up pops the old law again. And we went through that. It was, it, was all, it was a very distressing time last time we went through this, and we're probably going to end up going through it again if there is a repeal. So repeal won't be permanent, and it, it, and it won't be total. We'll get something that's very confusing and will be designed to generate revenue. So you gotta keep your eye on that when you're thinking about reviews. Um, here's the Connecticut system. You can see Connecticut has a $2 million exemption, and I put, I put um, on the table what the taxes would be at certain levels for a Connecticut estate. Okay, now here, here's a really important reason to review. We've, we've tried to reach our clients on this issue, but I, I have to say I think clients are deaf to this. They just don't want to be bothered with this problem. There are a lot of wills out there that include uh, a formula where when the, the death of the first spouse, or the first death occurs, an amount equal to the federal exemption is carved out of the estate and goes to a trust for the surviving spouse. That's, that's what this diagram is meant to represent. There is, in this case, a $6 million estate. The federal exemption in this time period was $2 million. So this is the, this is the result they expected under the 2008 rules. The $2 million federal exemption would go to the federal tr for the uh, exemption trust. Wife would get the rest. That's the result that, that was expected back then when a formula was used based on the federal exemption. But the federal exemption has been increasing. So as the federal exemption increased to this number, which is what we have right now, this may be the result that would be that you'd get if death were to occur in 2017. Same will, will hasn't been saved, the 2000, I mean changed, the 2008 will has not been changed during this period. What's changed is the federal exemption. The formula says, put the federal exemption in the trust, everything else to wife. So the wife is in effect dis, dis, been disinherited in large part. We really want to reach people with this problem uh, but like I say, I, I think it's being lost because it's kind of a complicated concept. And not only that, not only will the wife be disinherited here, but the amount that goes into this trust is more than the Connecticut exemption, and therefore there's a Connecticut tax to pay on it. So that's not a good result. And so people who have these formula wills from you know, 2008 and back really need to have them reviewed because that, that's, that's a terrible result. The surviving spouse is gonna be very, very unhappy and, and it's not our fault. We're screaming, please review. And there are other, there are other provisions that have similar, a similar formula that sometimes relate to charitable uh, dispositions and generation skipping tax dispositions. So it's not just the marital um, husband and wife situation, uh, sometimes a single person might have a provision that is related to the federal exemption. So, okay, back to incapacity, planning for incapacity, one of the things we need to think about when we're reviewing, and Allison's gonna get into that. But I wanna talk a bit about revocable trusts. Because those of you out there who have not considered revocable trust, especially as, as you get older, it's probably time to give it a second look because I can tell you over the years, my views on, on this have changed uh, quite a bit. They've changed as the probate court system has been reformed and changed. They've changed as my clients have aged and they've changed with the number of clients we get in that have been the victims of 
financial elder abuse. And in thinking about ways to, to make sure that there's, there's some responsible people looking in on your financial situation, somebody who, who you can count on not using your vulnerability to their own advantage. A, a revocable trust can be a very good way of setting things up so that other people, whether it's your accountant or your lawyer or a best friend, can look in on the situation and make sure somebody knows what's going on when there's an effort being made by, a, by either a caregiver, an unscrupulous caregiver, or an unscrupulous child to, to basically get his hand in your pocket and take it for himself. Powers of attorney are, notoriously, are notorious for being abused when it comes to this because in a way it's so easy to use them without some outside eyeballs looking in. So when you do a revocable trust, you could set it up so that you have outside, objective, dispassionate, but caring eyeballs looking in. Now, I do wanna, I'm talking about revocable trusts as if everybody here knows what they are. So maybe I should explain a little bit. This chart, obviously, that demarcation is pretty obvious. That's death. Now, before you, before you pass away, you see, wills have no effect at all. A will is only effective at death. A revocable trust is established through a trust agreement. That's something you do now while you're alive. And because it's established now, it can be, it is effective before you pass away. And it can have provisions in it that deal with lifetime issues, like your incapacity. So when you set up this agreement, Let's say I'm the, I'm the one creating the trust. I'm called the grantor. And as the grantor, I, I go to my attorney and I have him write up an agreement. And the agreement says that I'm the main beneficiary of the trust. I can revoke it any time I want. I can amend it any time I want. And I appoint the trustees of the trust. Usually I'm a trustee. I personally believe it's a good idea to have a co-trustee. And uh, as long as I'm the trustee and I'm, I'm doing okay, I can make all the decisions for the trust. The other co-trustee doesn't have to get involved. But there are provisions in there that say on my incapacity, then that other co-trustee can take over. You can set it up so that there be, at that point, two trustees, or you can set it up so that some outside institution or presence person can get information regarding that trust, provisions that say, um, please send copies of my statements to so-and-so or my accountant on a regular basis so that those eyeballs are looking in. So it's a way to make sure that your, what's going on with your assets is not being isolated from the rest of the world, that there's, there's sunlight being being uh, shown on, on all these transactions instead of um, unscrupulous caregiver or other family member trying to, to isolate you and move you away from the rest of the world so that you'll be dependent only on them. That's a very vulnerable position to be in and nobody wants to be in that position, but, you, but, you, but you're gonna need help. You're gonna need people involved that you can count on and a revocable trust, I think, is the best way to do that through the terms of the trust. Once again, though, the people you pick, that's the most important part of this thing. Uh, it, the plan is only as good as the people you pick. The, uh, and then at death, the terms of the trust agreement can dispose of the trust assets just like your will could dispose. Any, any type of instructions you can put in your will, you can also put in your revocable trust. So what happens, you enter into this agreement and then the next step is you retitle your assets so it's owned by the trust. The trust can't control anything except trust property. So when you have the agreement finished and you've named a trustee, you're going to retitle your assets 
so that your assets are owned by the trust and that's how the trustee, that's, that means the trustee has control over it now. And if you do it with respect to all your assets, except retirement plan accounts, don't do it for that. But if you do it with respect to all of your assets, you avoid probate as well. Now, personally, I don't think avoiding probate is that big a deal, but it's a little bigger deal than it was before. And I'll explain why. The probate courts have gotten a little slower. I mean, it's just the fact of life. Um, in the old days, where everybody was critical of the probate courts, it was like lightning. I mean, things, routine things could get done very quickly. With reform, they've slowed down a good bit. Um, so I like the revocable trust, partly because I don't have to worry about that delay. That trustee, the trustee serving as uh, trustee of your revocable trust when you pass away, is going to have pretty much immediate access to the funds. Of course, you want to make sure he's a trustworthy, he, she, it, trustworthy trustee, that immediate access is, is access. Um, the power to do good is also the power to do bad. So you, you want, once again, most important, pick the right people. But assuming you have the right people, that right person has almost immediate access to the funds instead of having to go through a probate proceeding which could take, you know, six weeks, right? It depends on the court. It kind of, one court can be much faster than the other. So, and I'm not gonna get in any trouble by telling you which courts are the slow ones and which are the fast ones. Because there's gonna be a probate judge maybe watching this someday. Because um, obviously we're doing a video and uh, we plan on posting it to YouTube so that you can go back and, and uh, you, you might think, did he really say that? And then you go back and you look. Uh, but if I were to say anything bad about a probate court, we, we'd edit it out. <laughs> the, um, I like it when I get a laugh every day. It, but, I, but it's disconcerting, I lose my train of thought. Um, okay, continuing trust in the probate court. A, um, if you set up a trust through the terms of your will, it's subject to the jurisdiction of the court. The trust stays subject to the jurisdiction of the court. Um, and it's a requirement at the end of the line when the trust terminates that the trustee file an accounting to the court. Once upon a time, um, not too long ago, the maximum fee for that type of account was $750. Well, things have changed. And so just for a 10 year account uh, with this fact pattern, the fee might be close to $4,000. So the administration of a trust in the probate court is a bit more expensive than it used to be. If you do it through, through a revocable trust, a trust that's established by agreement and not subject to probate court jurisdiction, then you can avoid that fee. The trustee, if need be, can always ask the court for assistance because the court has jurisdiction if the trustee asks for assistance. Um, but there are many situations when on termination of a trust, the termination can occur in a, a business-like manner without probate court involvement. So that's one thing to keep in mind. On the other hand, the probate court fees for settling an estate, those upfront fees, it's not gonna make any difference whether you avoid probate or not. The probate court fee will be the same no matter what. And here are the, the new probate court fees, pretty new. Um, and you can see they've, they've increased, but there's really nothing you can do about this. They've increased, the cap was 12.5 for, you know, big estates. And uh, now the cap is 40,000. So, um, but in fairness to the probate courts, you know, the, the state legislature dumps a lot of social service responsibilities on the court that don't pay anything. It's gotta fund itself somehow. Um, so it's, it's had to increase fees or else it would have to be calling on the uh, general fund for help and you know the type of shape the general fund is and so 
So don't be too hard on the probate court. The probate court, I think, does a wonderful job most of the time. We've con gone through many of these changes in circumstances that you might go through, so I'm not gonna spend any more time on that. I do want to spend some time on this. This is very depressing. This, this, this topic is so depressing. And what I'm talking about is people your age, not, not your age, <laughs> but, but people my age approaching retirement, uh, people who have retired, they come into the office and, you know, I've been telling people 80% of the time, I, that may be an exaggeration, but it seems like 80% of the time when I ask them, where, where are you going to live in a few years? They say someplace else, not in Connecticut. And we've had quite a few estates that we're handling where people have moved away, uh, but there are estates but they've, they've kept real estate in Connecticut. Now, when you want to change your home for tax purposes, you want to change your tax home or your domicile, to do it properly, you pretty much have to give up your connections here in Connecticut. You don't give up your church membership, you do that. You give up your car registration, you get it registered in the other state, voting registration, do it in another state, file your individual income tax returns in another state, all these things, club memberships in another state, don't keep them up here, don't travel up here too much. So you, you need to, that's, that's to make it clear to our Department of Revenue Services that you're giving up your domicile, you have to do all those things. And in addition, even if you've done all those things, if you have real estate up here, that's their opportunity to make life miserable for your executor or your trustee. Because you won't be able to sell that real estate someday or your beneficiaries won't be able to sell it someday unless you get a release of estate tax lien. And you're not gonna be able to do that without going to the probate court or going, well, filing a tax return with the Department of Revenue Services. Also, if you, if you own that property in your own name solely, it's probate property, you're gonna to have to go through the probate court. So they know the property's there, they're gonna, they're, and, and they know they've got you. They've got you until, because they can hold back that estate tax lien until the tax is settled. It's gonna make it hard for you to sell the property someday uh, without paying the tax. So, what do you do when you go down to Florida or Texas, wherever you end up going, you decide, well, I'm gonna give up my home in Connecticut. That's one thing you can do. Or the other thing you can do is make sure somebody else owns it. And when, you, when you're making sure somebody else owns it, a revocable trust won't be good enough. But a limited liability company is, seems to be the best way. But it can't be a limited liability, or shouldn't be. It's risky if you try to make it a limited liability company with only one member, where you're the sole member. You need, you need more than one member to make this a real thing. And there's some chances that even that won't work. But that's, but that's something you should think about when you're moving off to Florida and I, you know, you give me a final handshake and say goodbye. You know, it's sad. It's sad to see you all go. But, um, but if your real estate's here, I'm gonna see you. I'm gonna see you again. <laughs> And we've been through some very, very difficult audits with the DRS. Um, maybe some of you have remarried, time to review your estate plan. And if you've done a prenuptial agreement, it's, it's, you gotta make sure your will, you know, takes care of any obligations you have under that agreement. Birth of a child, that should be an obvious one. Anybody here who is married to a non-citizen spouse and they become a citizen, well, you probably had some, some provisions in your old will that dealt with the non-citizenship issue and the tax consequences of that, so you, you might want to review that. And also, if, if you did some planning back then with a non-citizen spouse involved, you might have, an insurance uh, salesman might have suggested that you own the, the life insurance in a different way. Now you can undo that. Let's see, Allison, how long have I been? Okay, 40 minutes. Um, you know, in the beginning, when it said how long we were going to talk, it said I was going to talk for 20 minutes, I think. That was just aspirational. And Allison gave me permission to go over. So, 
I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm done. We can take questions at the end.